Okay, hi everyone and welcome. My name is Brooke Christensen and I'm a PhD student in the Daily Lab in the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology at the University of California, Irvine. I'm happy to welcome you to another in a series of workshops on integrative organismal modeling of movement. These workshops have been sponsored by the NSF Division of Organismal Systems and will be recorded and shared as an online resource hosted through UCI's Center for Integrative Movement Sciences. And with that, thank you all very much for being here and for your attention today. And I'm going to hand it off to today's workshop speakers. Thank you. Good morning, everyone, at least everyone in the, in the US. Uh, good afternoon or good evening or uh, whatever the appropriate salutation is, depending on where you are. Um, thanks, everybody, for coming today. I'm really happy to kick off uh, this um, workshop uh, that uh, you know, nominally is titled Feed Forward and Feedback Control, which is an overwhelmingly uh, broad topic um, and hopefully everybody can see my screen. Okay, let me just double check that first with my organizer, the co-host. Co okay, great. So uh, feed, feed forward and feedback control is uh, um, borrowed from control theory jargon and can really mean uh, a lot of different things. And this is just a, a simple you know, diagram that I made yesterday just to illustrate how uh, incredibly complicated uh, things can end up being especially when we start to recognize that different communities use, you know, often very different language to mean uh, the same things. Um, and you'll see things like forward models and inverse models and feedback control and feed forward control, uh, reflex loops, reafference, which is not a term that as a control engineer, uh, I learned until I started talking to biologies and I've learned it to just mean feedback. Um, uh, so there's all these different words that can make it very hard for people interested in biology that are control engineers uh, to make heads or tails of the biology literature and uh, biologists that are interested in applying ideas from control engineering uh, um, to, to figure out how to read uh, the appropriate uh, literature. So I'll come back to this diagram at the end. But first, I want to start by really simply uh, defining terms. My uh, uh, opening um, discussion today is really going to be uh, simple and pragmatic. I want to try to make sure that you know we're all kind of defining the same, uh, using the same terms, at least for the point of view of this this workshop. Um, and and uh, to start, you know, when I'm as a control engineer, when I have a, a a box and arrow plot, a block diagram, I actually really mean something quite formal. Uh, it's not simply a qualitative way of representing how the system might be interconnected in an intuitive sense, but I'm actually making a concrete and very specific hypothesis about the way various signals are flowing through a system. Um, and of course, that hypothesis is going to be a highly simplified representation of what's going on. Um, uh, but to start with, but 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 I mean, but ultimately, uh, I'm really thinking about it in a formal way as a formal and testable uh, model, a topological model, if you will. So in this context, you know, for those that are, you know, maybe more coming from the biological side, when you see a box in a diagram that I would make, it is going to be a dynamical system possibly just a static gain, but at least some sort of a mapping between a, uh, one signal and another signal. Uh, and I call this thing P. In this ex simple example, P is the plant, again, borrowing from uh, control theory jargon. And I have to say this joke every time. In our case, the plant is the animal. Um, uh, and it's a mapping, in this case, from some set of uh, muscle commands, EMGs, um, which control engineers would call the input to the plant. Biologists would call it the motor output. So that's another example where things get a little bit confusing. And that gets processed through some dynamics that can be maybe modeled as a differential equation or a transfer function if it's a linear system and then ultimately produces uh, movement. Um, but then wait a second, you know, why are, why are these arrows single directional? That's what block diagrams, uh, how I grew up learning about block diagrams. Why are they single uh, directional? We're gonna come back to that. And, and the idea there is um, uh, this notion of impedance and, and impedance matching and insulation. So, um, so control diagrams are really formal models and how you draw a block diagram makes intrinsic assumptions and invariably strips away uh, a lot of really potentially important detail, but, uh, but maybe you intend to strip away that detail in order to get at a very specific uh, uh, question. And so changing the topology is a really valuable way to test the assumptions of your model. For example, if you believe that a model is interconnected in a certain way and you cut a particular loop or add a particular loop, you can actually make predictions about what the output will be in that new scenario. And if your predictions are violated, then you're violating either, uh, often some that implies you're violating something, some assumption about your um, underlying topology. Um, and so uh, 
at least in my lab, we often start a sensory motor investigation by, by trying to construct what we think is a good hypothesis for a block diagram. You know, later we often realize we made assumptions that were wrong and we modify that diagram, but we start with, with a diagram as a formal model. Um, and, uh, and it allows us actually to be in some ways uh, and sometimes agnostic about what's going on in a particular box, as long as we understand how those boxes are interconnected. And so um, one example and something that I've maybe uh, a, a trap that I've often fallen into is that uh, we often take as the reference uh, an external signal that we provide to the system, you know, but ultimately if an animal is trying to uh, do some control such as catch the rabbit, it has a an internal perceptual reference that it has to compare that external signal to. And it's, it's maybe a fallacy to draw that as a, as a subtraction of an external reference uh, with a feedback signal, but rather there needs to be an internal reference that it's being compared to. And if you're interested in learning more about that, um, uh, there's this edited collection on perceptual control theory, where really understanding that, standing that perceptual, perceptual reference is the name of the game. I'm not, I'm not gonna talk about that any, anymore in this uh, talk, but recognize that I'm probably making this, this um, uh, topological assumption that the external reference is the reference in many of the diagrams that I'm gonna show you. So a couple of warnings, biology doesn't uh, necessarily match engineering and substance. In fact, I would say it usually doesn't. Uh, and in fact, the distinction between the plant or the system that's being controlled and the controller is blurred for a lot of reasons. For example, they actually co-evolved. So which one's controlling the other is not always clear. Uh, but, in, but even if you can make that separation, uh, can we, can we, can we um, uh, create two boxes that I can draw one directional arrows through? And that turns out from a, from a practical point of view, really important because most control theory has been developed in the context of this one way flow of information. And so if we wanna use control theoretic ideas, it's extremely helpful to understand when we can and can't make the assumption that in some sense, a, a system doesn't push back on a, on a given signal. So for example, if I, if I push on this object, I generate a force, of course it generates an equal and opposite force, but importantly, the, mus the forces that my muscles generate end up changing as a function of how much that object moves due to things like force length and force velocity curves. So it turns out force is probably not, uh, in general, the, the force that's generated by a muscle is probably not the right place to cut that loop because there you have this retroactivity where a change in motion actually affects the force. And we don't want that two-way street if we wanna really borrow ideas from control engineering. Neuroscience, on the other hand, uh, is special in biology as, a, as opposed to say cellular uh, biology, as Sontag et al. have shown, uh, neuroscience is potentially special because the nervous system really stands apart uh, from the body-plant interaction, body-environment uh, interaction, which I'm going to call the plant, because of high impedance at the sensory and motor interfaces. When an when a electrical signal discharges into muscle, the forces may depend on the length, but the EMG signal itself does not, except via feedback loops. So obviously as the system moves and there are sensory uh, uh, receptors that are measuring that movement, they can then uh, um, rise back up into the nervous system and change the motor command. But the EMG signal itself is in, in a sense insulated from the ultimate movement that it produces. So it provides a natural place to cut this feedback loop. And on the sensory receptor side, um, a similar sort of thing. If I see an object move, there's not cytons coming out of my eyes that are affecting the object movement. Um, uh, and, and therefore changing what I'm perceiving. This isn't always the case. I think touch is a really special example where that line gets blurred because as I touch something and say use uh, um, uh, either um, uh, uh, you know, pressure sensors and other things that require substantial force, then maybe this, this distinction is not as clear. But for many of the problems that we look at uh, in uh, biological motor control, uh, the sensory receptors and the motor units provide a really natural place to separate these two things out and then makes that makes control engineering a, a better analogous um, framework uh, than it would be for say um, uh, cellular uh, mechanisms. Uh, and it was actually through a set of interactions that I had with Eduardo Sontag, um, you know, a decade or so ago at a workshop organized by uh, uh, Tom Daniel and others uh, that got me really thinking about this. And then we finally wrote it down in a paper um, a couple of years ago with my former postdoc Manu Madov. So um, other cautions, is that the mapping between the different communities can be really confusing. So um, in uh, biology, we talk about sensory stimuli, we talk about sensory uh, inputs, and we talk about motor outputs. Uh, 
but the motor output in biology is what a control engineer would call the input because a control engineer is thinking about a system they're trying to control and then uh, asking him or herself the question, how do I design a controller where I can create that input that makes the system do what I wanna do? Uh, as an experimentalist, we wanna make a stimulus and measure response. So we think about the, uh, the say the EMG signals as an output of the sensory motor transform. And so just, you know, just be careful when you're reading these things to make sure you know what people are talking about. You can usually figure it out from context, but it can certainly uh, be confusing. And I've really royally confused other people when talking about this when I realized, when I didn't realize we weren't using the same jargon. So again, I wanna be really practical here. Uh, feed forward and feed back. Uh, this is kind of a broad overview of the uh, points that I wanna to make today. Feed forward and feed back are topological terms, in, at least in the way that I'm gonna think about it. Uh, you can think about feed forward as being topologically open loop, whereas feedback is topologically closed loop. There's a feedback interconnection. Um, and uh, uh, most of what uh, I, uh, Andrea, and Brad will talk about are using these notions to describe experimental topologies. But in addition, we want to use them to think about the underlying biological control mechanisms. So those are two different uh, approach two different um, uh, types of questions we might want to address. What's our experimental paradigm? Is it open or closed loop? Um, and uh, what is the underlying control computation? Is it feed forward or feedback or both? Um, and I want to talk just a little bit briefly about what forward and inverse models are, because I know that uh, I have found them very confusing when talking to people in various communities. Um, uh, and then CPGs are a, are a really interesting one. CPGs are really often described and talked about in the biological literature as feed forward systems. And there's an important sense in which they are, but topologically they almost invariably exist inside of a feedback loop. And so um, I think it's better and, and uh, Alka and I have really debated this point. I think it is, is better to think about CPGs as an element of a feedback system that in a limiting case can act like a feed forward system, um, uh, but, um, and not sort of say a, the CPG is the feed forward part and the reflexes are the feedback part. I don't think that's, I don't really think that's the right way to think about it. And then we're gonna talk about some examples. So um, uh, just really quickly, some overview of experimental uh, topologies, probably the most common one uh, in behavior is a behaviorally open loop untethered experiment where you provide some stimulus to an animal and examine its behavior in an untethered context. So that is to say it's not bound, uh, for example, a, um, a, a cockroach riding on top of a tread ball or a um, fly glued to the end of a stick. Those would be examples of, of tethered behavior. Uh, and But an animal moving in a free environment uh, where you can control sensory stimuli in an open loop fashion, meaning to say as I've written here, you design a reference stimulus in advance, you play that reference stimulus to the organism and you measure its response. Um, okay, I'm currently pointing to the fact that the feedback diagram is actually a, looks like a closed loop system and it is because the animal's sensory feedback is still intact, but from an experimental point of view, it's behaviorally open loop. I am not controlling the stimulus as a function of the animal's behavior. Um, um, you can also define behaviorally closed loop paradigms where uh, the animal still has its own sensory feedback, but you can close additional feedback loops where you're measuring the animal's behavior and feeding it back in real time. This is something that we've done um, uh, quite a lot lately in my own lab. Uh, and it has helped us, that closing of the feedback loop helped us get at a fundamental nonlinear control system that uh, electric fish use to control their behavior. So electric fish, when they're swimming inside of a tube, will wiggle back and forth uh, in what we believe and pretty, I think clearly demonstrated as an active sensing behavior. And um, we did a feedback loop where we controlled the movement of the refuge that the fish was swimming in to make it move say in the opposite direction of the animal, enhancing the feedback from this active sensing movement. And we saw that that led to a suppression of the animal's movement. And vice versa, if we move the tube in the same direction as the animal, but at a lower gain, I didn't do that very well. So the fish moves forward and I move the, the shuttle forward the same amount, but at a lower gain, that actually suppresses the active feedback. And what we found is that the animal maintained the kind of root mean square of that error signal. 
right? By, and it was by virtue of this closed loop artificial feedback that we were able to uh, discover that. And so you can check that out in uh, my current postdocs, um, current biology paper, although he did that during a rotation in my lab when he was a graduate student. Um, uh, uh, later, you'll see some uh, really uh, elegant work from Andrea's lab looking at uh, uh, open loop paradigms where an animal is immobilized and a stimulus is presented. And then you can, uh, this is probably the most common uh, type of neurophysiological experiment uh, that's done in, in acute recordings. It's becoming more common to allow animals obviously to freely behave, but a very valuable framework is to take the animal out of that reafferent feedback loop to just measure the way uh, uh, signals are processed in an open loop fashion. So I'll not take anything more about that. And it does not involve this kind of uh, closed reafferent feedback, um, but that can be uh, modified, for example, by measuring some neural or behavioral output of an animal while it's tethered, and then feeding that back to an input. This is really commonly done in the insect flight um, domain where animals are glued to the end of a small stick and there's a visual panorama that uh, is under closed loop control of the animal uh, by virtue of measurements of, of behavior. Um, that can also be done on the basis of uh, electrophysiology. The electric fish community uh, for decades studied how the so-called jamming avoidance response in electric fish works by immobilizing an animal, uh, measuring its uh, electric field output, and, and then closing a loop on um, uh, a set of uh, ele stimulus electrodes that are in the water. So you can do this fictive uh, closed loop uh, preparations. And um, uh, about almost, uh, I guess eight years ago, um, my former uh, PhD student, Itai Roth and, and Simon Sponberg, who actually did a really, uh, you know, co-hosted a really nice uh, workshop that, that went over some of these ideas, um, described a, a kind of hierarchy of these uh, experimental topologies from uh, the top one here, which is completely free behaving, uh, um, experimentally open loop behavior where you leave all of the richness of the sensory feedback intact uh, to the animal. And so it, it, the animal's behavior is closed loop, but our stimulus response paradigm is open loop. Um, then you can selectively open various feedback loops. For example, a really simple thing to do is turn off the lights and take away uh, visual reafferent feedback, uh, for example. Um, you can also create sensory conflicts in this kind of paradigm. Uh, and there's a number of examples that we described then, but also many that have happened since that paper uh, that do that. Um, uh, all the way down to uh, block diagram C there, which shows this uh, fictive uh, uh, feedback to purely open loop uh, examples like uh, Andrea will describe um, and so forth. So uh, if you're interested, you can go check out that current biology paper. Um, but in addition to experimental topologies, you know, I first learned about feed forward and feedback architectures as an undergraduate uh, at Ohio State studying control theory as a way of designing control systems for um, to achieve a certain goal. And so I wanna talk just briefly about that. So um, feed forward control is, uh, was described as it, the way it was described to me and the way it's taught in, in uh, control theory curricula is that it's a mechanism for designing a compensator that doesn't require measurement of the output of the system that you're trying to control. So it's feed for, it's a feed forward control architecture where you have some reference that you're trying to achieve and you pass that reference through some kind of a filter or dynamical system, or it can be a simple gain. The most common type of feed forward controller is just to invert the, the steady state gain of the plant. Uh, and then um, uh, ultimately that creates an input to your plant uh, and then something happens. And hopefully it's what you want to have happen, but you have no sensor uh, to make sure. And so these are really cheap. They don't require sensors um, and uh, they can be used to kind of anticipate the control signal uh, that you need uh, in order to um, uh, generate a desired output. And I believe that uh, Alki might describe a little bit about how CPGs might be thought about in that way as well, even though they're part of a feedback loop. Um, so again, these aren't, um, uh, in, independent ideas. And then uh, feedback control um, is probably a little bit more common, especially because you can go onto, you know, Copley's website and, and, and buy a PID controller and have it shipped to your house. Um, it's very uh, cheap these days to get uh, uh, sensors. It has been for a long time. And 
uh, feedback-based control is uh, far more robust to things like uncertainties in your plant. Your plant might change over time due to temperature variations and so forth. Uh, and feedback control provides great rust robustness to those kinds of uncertainties. Um, its drawback is that it requires sensors um, and then it can be, uh, you know, I don't know if this is a drawback so much as, because you could always just not do it, but a, but a limitation you have to consider is that you can't get infinite bandwidth out of such a, such a system. And if you try to use, you know, too high of gains and there's uh, feedback delays, you can drive your system unstable. You, as long as your plant and your feed forward controller are both individually stable, then chaining them together maintains stability. That's another uh, important advantage of feed forward control. But this is again, not a dichotomy. You can actually have both in one system. Here's an example, very, very, very common engineering control architecture where you take a, a reference signal, you pass it through a feed forward controller and you, you will see that, that the processing of that feed forward controller never has any knowledge of the ultimate output of the system. But if everything goes well and you've perfectly inverted your plant, then your output will do exactly what you want and your feedback doesn't have to do anything. But any little small variations in your output can be corrected via feedback um, it, uh, through that loop there. And you can see that the one term I didn't describe there, that little circle with the plus and minus coming into it as a summing junction. I simply take the difference of my reference and my feedback, get an error signal and pass that through a feedback controller. And if you design those two things really well, um, which again is the topic of, of engineering control design classes, you can get really good performance and get the best of both, both worlds. Um, feedback control is an endless topic. Perhaps the most uh, common type of control is PID control. I always like to emphasize that mechanical systems are inherently second order, which means that the most important variables are position and velocity. So there's a really important way in which proportional, meaning uh, um, a sort of a position information and derivative, meaning a velocity information, is an awful lot like state feedback. So PD control looks like state feedback, add an integrator and you can help deal with uh, uncertainties and disturbances and reject. Uh, and, and in fact, a very natural way of thinking about a disturbance often is a constant disturbance as some state that you wanna estimate that's constant and an integrator provides an estimate of that disturbance. So a PID controller can really be thought of as state feedback uh, where Two of the states are your positions and velocities of your mechanical system, and one of your states is a constant unknown disturbance. And so um, uh, I will say that I'm, I'm using a lot of linear control ideas. Locomotion is intrinsically nonlinear in almost all circumstances because uh, uh, animals locomote by uh, undulating append appendages in a periodic fashion. Uh, leading to limit cycle like behavior. You cannot get limit cycles out of linear systems. Um, so uh, uh, CPGs can provide a really valuable kind of mechanism for dealing with those kinds of nonlinearities by setting up strong attractors with large basins of attraction um, uh, that, can be, that can interact with the system. Um, but the feedback topologies that we're drawing here uh, are unchanged. So um, I see I left my little summing junction there in the middle of that diagram, which uh, isn't important, but um, and you're going to see some really uh, beautiful examples from uh, Brad uh, looking at the role of Haltier in these tightly regulated uh, feedback systems um, with notions of uh, PID type uh, uh, control topologies. Um, okay, so uh, forward and inverse models, what are they and, and why, do we, why do we care? So um, I often hear in the motor control, motor control literature, the human motor control literature in particular, uh, people are often talking about forward and inverse models. And I just want to describe, you know, really briefly what they are, just uh, uh, in case you, you're, not, you're not sure. I certainly got confused. So if we have a given system, let's say it's our plant, it's the thing that maps EMG signals to kinematics, a forward model that I would have inside my brain would be a model that simulates the dynamics of that plant. And, and that there's really good reason uh, to do that. Uh, you might have heard of things like corollary discharge or efference copy uh, in biology. In control engineering, it's the, uh, you have a simulated dynamical system that is a copy of your plant and you need to run the control input through it that you're going to actually also send to the plant. So the topology would be you have an actual control signal going out to your plant and you have a copy of that control signal going to your internal model 
your internal model then produces an expectation of what the sensory output would be in one example of, of a use of, of a forward model. And then you can compare those and see how off you were and make corrections uh, to your internal uh, state estimate. An inverse model, on the other hand, is um, uh, instead of simulating the effect of a control signal, like an EMG signal, you would calculate what EMG signal you need based on a desired reference. And you would do that by saying, well, if I know the plant, then let me think about how to invert the dynamics of that plant so that if I have a desired output, I can get the, the, the necessary U that would create that desired output. And this is you know, one of the really common and basic ways to design a feed forward controller is just to, as best as you can, invert the plant. Now you can rarely invert the plant perfectly um, for a lot of technical reasons that I won't go into here, but you can partially invert the plant and do so over a bandwidth that's important to you for control. Um, and you just, and this is the example for how you would do that. And um, uh, you basically invert the, you invert the plant. I'm gonna leave the discussion of CPGs to uh, Alka, the real expert, but um, I just want to uh, uh, just emphasize the fact that CPGs do exist in the context of a feedback circuit. And it's, you don't really need to think that, think about CPGs as feed forward and reflexes as feedback. They're really an interconnected uh, system. And um, I really like this diagram from this uh, uh, incredible uh, paper by uh, Holmes and colleagues uh, that uh, looks at CPGs in a context of both centralized versus decentralized control. For example, a spinal circuit of multiple uh, individual oscillators and how they're interconnected. That's the centralized versus decentralized and feed forward control where the CPG drives the behavior and there's no feedback to that CPG versus fully feedback driven, like maybe a walking insect, a, a, a stick insect that where the, where the patterns are largely driven by feedback. And so um, uh, they, uh, I still wanna think about though the feed forward as being the limiting, the limiting case only where there's absolutely no feedback, but it's still useful to think about the fact that the CPG can generate that pattern in the absence of feedback. And so um, in the, in the rest of the, talks, we're going to move to some examples. I just want to give uh, one example of a system um, that is uh, uh, being examined by uh, my student, Dee Chow, and, and uh, her lab mate, Michael uh, Wilkinson, is working with her on that project, where we're using a virtual reality uh, system. Uh, this was a, a brilliant idea that they had during the pandemic. We were able to ship these VR systems to people's homes so that we could continue to get data. Uh, and um, we're looking at the interplay between feed forward and feedback control in patients with uh, cerebellar, or individuals I should say with cerebellar ataxia. Um, and uh, I won't go in, into the details, but quite counter to our intuition, we discovered that, um, I should say Dee really discovered that uh, patient, uh, uh, individuals with cerebellar ataxia, which is a, a disorder that leads to movement discoordination, uh, uh, have very largely intact both feed forward and feedback control, and both are able to benefit from a manipulation that I want to show where we give a preview of where the target is going to move, and both are able to benefit nearly equally well uh, uh, from this, all of which was extremely counterintuitive to us, uh, but it, it allowed us basically to tease apart, and I'll just show these little diagrams, it allowed us to tease apart both the feed forward and the feedback controllers uh, using this uh, uh, con control theory approach. Okay, great. Uh, so I'm gonna talk about how um, some of these concepts of feed forward and feedback loops are implemented in the experimental space in systems neuroscience um, with a particular focus on how animals process visual motion um, and how we currently study these loops and then um, briefly how technology is changing this. So um, moving through the environment is a really complex task, um, and it's amazing how the brain is able to process and respond instantaneously to this um, flood of information. So birds are able to do this in flight um, and avoid colliding with trees and branches, um, but it's not just uh, high-speed birds that deal with this. Um, in fact, we experience this, these kinds of visual signals as well. 
Um, driving is a complex real world task. Uh, it requires um, a lot of perceptual motor and attentional functions and driving well um, demonstrates selective visual attention, target interception, um, obstacle avoidance and coordination of eye movements in natural settings. So all visual animals have to develop strategies to uh, navigate cluttered space and stay on course. So being able to use sensory information in order to visualize and respond to a changing environment is um, essential to animal success. Animals use a number of sensors that send information about the environment. Then neural responses are coordinated in the um, CNS. Uh, commands are then sent to the musculoskeletal system, and these facilitate behavior, creating the opportunity for new sensory inputs. Um, so here I'm gonna focus on vision. Um, so when you think about the hawk or the hawk flying through the trees uh, or humans walking down a crowded sidewalk, um, we all clearly rely on vision. So thinking about feedback and feed forward control. If you want to ask questions about visual guidance, locomotion, one avenue of research is to um, explore components of visual motor reflexes. So humans can actively move their eyes in a range of directions. Um, you know, we perform eye saccades, change fixation points between objects. Um, we use smooth pursuit eye movements to keep um, moving objects in focus. Um, and to stabilize the eyes, there's really two reflexes that play um, major roles, the vestibular ocular reflex and the optokinetic reflex. So um, the VOR can be sort of viewed as a feed forward mechanism that uses linear and angular acceleration measured by the vestibular system to control eye muscles um, in order to stabilize the image on the retina. Um, Eye movements in freely moving mice, for instance, um, constantly stabilize the animal's visual field by counteracting head rotations through the VOR. So these are um, uh, optic flow maps that show areas of the retina um, or areas of the visual field um, in mice that have like low and high motion. Um, and so for instance, during, um, pursuit, the image of the prey, in this case a cricket, um, consistently falls in a localized visual region, and this region allows the least most motion-induced image blur. So in contrast, the um, OKR, which is based on um, visual feedback, is used to um, fixate an object um, while there um, might be relative motion between the object and the observer. So in pigeons, the eye moves with the head. There's basically very little um, eye movement. So in this strobe photograph of a pigeon's head bob, you can see that there's a phase where they hold their head and eyes stable in space. And um, this suggests that it's equivalent to the pursuit phase of the optokinetic um, head movements. OK, so um, one visual signal that's used in these reflexes um, is represented in these images, it's called optic flow. So um, optic flow is a global visual signal that is generated by movement through one's environment. Um, it's known to be important for guiding locomotion um, and navigation, and um, animals use changes in optic flow to navigate between objects and um, stay on course. So uh, detecting optic flow is critical for these visual motor reflexes, as you can see um, in this video. Um, it's important for locomotion and a variety of other ecological phenomena, including um, prey predator detection um, and approach, timing approach to a target. Um, <clears throat> so if we zoom out again, um, sensory systems receive information that's um, compared to reference signals. We can apply perturbations between neural control and muscle action to manipulate the musculoskeletal system activity and locomotion, which will then you know, affect these um, reference signals. So people study this using different electrophysiological techniques um, with recent studies showing that um, motor signals modulate sensory 
physiology um, in different brain regions during activities ranging from whisking or facial movements to um, locomotion. Um, so uh, gaining a deeper understanding of this entire loop would be a really important step forward for um, systems neuroscience. Um, however, historically, like um, Noah mentioned, um, and this is true for the data that I'll show today, um, systems neuroscience studies have used um, open loop conditions. So stimuli is um, presented to elicit downstream responses in partially intact or immobilized preps. Um, the system is um, investigated in this like feed forward manner that's devoid of the closed loop behavioral context of the system. And then, um, I mean, one reason for doing this is that there's a clear benefit of using sort of sophisticated equipment that allows you to relate complex stimuli to very specific neural responses. Um, and I'll talk about some of that kind of data next. So uh, what makes a neuron an optic flow neuron? Um, optic flow neurons are characterized as direction and speeds selective. So each individual optic flow neuron will dramatically increase its firing rate in response to um, visual motion in one direction. And so this is called the um, preferred direction. And then um, optic flow neurons also respond to visual motion speeds. So they'll increase their firing rate or firing frequency um, in response to the um, speed of the visual motion. And there'll be some speed that is um, elicits the highest response. So it's the preferred speed. Um, and cells are often classed in this way as like fast or slow cells. So um, the pathway that processes optic flow is called the accessory optic system. In birds, optic flow is analyzed by two brainstem nuclei in the OS called the LM or lentiformis mesencephaly and the MBOR, um, which have large receptive fields and respond to direction and speed. Um, after recording a cell's response to large field motion in a series of directions, we can then calculate the mean vector of that response, which gives you the preferred direction. So that's what the um, purple arrow indicates. And then after you record from a bunch of um, these neurons, like from an entire population, you can plot um, each cell's preferred direction and you see the distribution of responses. So as it turns out, most LM neurons um, prefer forward motion and this, or temporal to nasal motion. And um, this pattern is observed in um, essentially all vertebrates tested to date. Um, conversely, in the NBOR, um, very few neurons prefer forward motion, um, but the other three directions are represented. So together, these two nuclei kind of um, complement each other and cover all axes of optic flow. So um, the optic flow processing circuit um, is not very well characterized in birds. Um, the LM and MBOR both receive direct input from the retina and, um, and then they go on to project to um, premotor areas like the inferior olive and cerebellum, which are important for sensory motor integration. So the um, LM, and MBOR also have homologous structures in mammals, so it's a conserved circuit. Um, and these cells are likely important for stabilization in flight. Um, so I take a systems neuroscience approach to study the neural circuits that underpin optic flow processing. Um, this takes an open loop approach using extracellular recordings of neural activity in response to visual stimuli. The overarching goal is to characterize the neuroanatomy and visual system responses to stimuli in order to provide insights to neural control of locomotion. And I won't go into the neuroanatomy here, but we have found that um, there are some interesting differences between species in um, these circuits or in the organization of these circuits um, that may support locomotor demands. So um, you might be wondering why small birds? Um, the uh, data I'm gonna show is from hummingbirds and zebra finches, and they both um, execute a number of rapid visual motor transformations. Um, and this also allows for a comparison between species with kind of different um, flight behaviors or flight modes. 
And then um, some earlier work by Doug Wiley and Andy Iwaniak showed that um, the LM in hummingbirds was um, hypertrophied relative to um, brain size and to a lesser extent in transiently hovering birds. So it was sort of hypothesized that this region of the brain was a, um, uh, a site of neural specialization for hovering. So given this specialization, I asked if hummingbird LM cells prefer slow speeds to support optic flow demands for hovering flight. Okay, so um, knowing a cell's preferred speed requires um, finding its preferred direction first. So I basically just present these um, dot fields moving in different a series of different directions and um, you get neural responses sort of like the raw trace on the right um, and then can produce um, the uh, and then find the preferred direction of the cell based on the response. So um, <clears throat> after recording from a population of LM neurons, I plotted each cell's preferred direction um, to see the sort of distribution of responses. So these polar histograms show the relative number of cells that um, prefer a given direction. Um, archival pigeon data in blue show just sort of that expected distribution of preferred directions with um, a preference for forward motion. And then I next recorded from the uh, from LM neurons in the zebra finch. So these birds perform that flat bounding flight. And um, the data show the sort of the same pattern of population level bias for forward motion. But interestingly, we found that the um, hummingbird LM does not have a population level bias for any direction. Um, and here, um, this in this final plot, we see like the um, these are normalized tuning curves for all the neurons um, plotted in polar coordinates and the thicker lines show um, the median values. So you can see that there's like a strong nasal bias for pigeons and zebra finches, but not for hummingbirds. So to determine the um, preferred speed, I moved a dot field in each cell's preferred and anti-preferred direction at different speeds to produce um, tuning curves like you see here. Um, one way we look at the velocity data was to plot the speeds at which a cell responds at at least 80% of the max firing rate. Um, so this is what those data look like in um, zebra finch and hummingbirds. Um, and, um, and so you can see that the hummingbirds prefer sort of these higher um, speeds. So I set out to find out if the expansion in the LM um, of hummingbirds resulted from an increase in these slow cells um, to support hovering flight, but um, that was incorrect. <laughs> um, they, um, so in, in addition to having um, sort of a unique response um, in their direction distribution, uh, hummingbird LM cells also prefer these higher velocities of visual motion. Um, and then just for future reference, because I'll come back to this, um, they, it turns out that they um, are tightly tuned to their um, preferred speed as well. Okay, so um, as I tried to understand the role of the LM, I wanted to find out whether the NBOR has changed in the same way as the LM did. So to do this, I analyzed the MBOR in three, the MBOR response in three domains. So direction preference, speed preference, and speed tuning width. Um, and basically, first off, the um, these histograms show that there's really no difference um, in the direction preference data. We found a lot of up, down, and back cells in all three species. Um, and then moving on to the speed data, um, I fit curves to the individual MBOR cell responses to, um, to speed of optic flow and plotted the peaks of these curves. Um, and again, there's no difference in the distribution of these preferred speeds. Um, but we finally looked at the, um, the width of the rising phase of the curve at the 50% max, which is the um, horizontal gray line, um, and found that the hummingbird optic flow neurons are more tightly tuned to their preferred speed. So you get this narrow tuning for speed. Um, so 
next we asked, you know, what are these high velocity optic flow neurons responding to? Um, and Michael Ibbotson, who studies um, optic flow in wallabies, wrote a dispatch piece about the, our original hummingbird LM study and suggested that the preference for high velocity motion could be related to behavior and habitat. Um, Essentially, hummingbirds spent a lot of their time um, navigating through cluttered environments and um, like, you know, like when they're darting through foliage and hovering at flowers. So because of their proximity to these elements, um, they, uh, they appear to be large and moving fast across the retina. So um, this was a great and testable idea. So we basically just need to move from dot fields to gratings, um, which allows us to vary um, spatial and temporal frequency. Um, and then we can ask if they're tuned to spatial temporal frequency or both. Um, and so basically you can plot temporal frequency against spatial frequency and the relationship of those two is equal to um, velocity. So each of these dashed lines is a um, velocity. Um, with high velocity in the top left and low velocities in the bottom right. And so if we're wanting to see why hummingbirds are preferring uh, or what's causing the preference for high or driving the preference for um, high velocities, if um, the hummingbirds are the pink dots, then um, we want to see how they're getting into the the top right corner, basically, or sorry, top left corner. Um, so this can either be with a shift along the spatial frequency axis to the left or a shift along the temporal frequency axis or a shift in both axes. So these histograms show um, LM cell responses to different combinations of spatial and temporal frequencies. Um, and we then made contour plots and then fit a 2D Gaussian to these data. Um, so given that we have previously shown that hummingbird LM neurons are more tightly tuned to velocity using random dot patterns. We thought that the, um, that they'd also be more tightly tuned in the spatio-temporal dom domain. Um, and that's exactly what we see here. So we um, looked at the volume under the Gaussian fit and see that it's smaller in hummingbirds compared to the other two species. Um, so we performed similar experiments with MBOR neurons and analyzed them in the same way. Um, most of the hummingbird neurons were responding to only a few of the 4A2 stimuli that were presented. Um, and these data mirror the tight velocity tuning of hummingbird LM and MBOR neurons to random dot patterns. And again, hummingbird MBOR cells are narrowly tuned in this domain. So then we next asked if differences in velocity preferences um, among species were due to differences in uh, preference for spatial frequency and or temporal frequency. Um, so preference was determined as the location of the peak of the um, 2D, best fit 2D Gaussian for each neuron. Um, so that's what's on in the plot on the left. Um, and then hummingbird LM neurons um, you know, using, or, through analyzing these data, we found that hummingbird LM neurons prefer high velocities, um, profoundly lower spatial frequency, and then um, slightly higher temporal frequencies. So um, this preference um, means that there's a high, sens high sensitivity to nearby objects such as leaves or branches when hovering um, or flying through dense foliage. OK, so. Um, Another way to characterize these cells is to determine whether their velocity or temporal frequency tuned. Um, so previous studies have suggested that um, pretectal optic flow neurons are tuned to a particular temporal frequency rather than um, velocity. Cons so this would be consistent with the correlation model of um, motion detection. Um, however, studies in pigeon MBOR found that the um, found that fast neurons were tuned to temporal frequency, but slow neurons had spatio-temporally oriented peaks suggesting velocity tuning. So um, these plots here show um, a contour plot and then two Gaussians um, constrained by either velocity or temporal frequency, which is also called spatio-temporally independent so, or, um, or like independently classed. So um, you basically look, for the um, best, like the goodness of fit of these two fits to uh, neurons 
um, contour plot tells you um, if it's velocity oriented or independent. Um, and then I'm going to skip that plot, I think. Um, so um, plotting, so then we plotted the partial correlations um, against um, each other and showed that all three species have velocity oriented spatiotemporally independent um, or, or temporal frequency oriented um, and unclassifiable cells, which are basically the cells that kind of don't fit well into either of those other bins. And ultimately we found that zebra finches have significantly more velocity oriented cells. So, and the, the final thing we showed that was kind of cool is that these orientations can shift. So most pigeon, LM, and wallaby NOT, so the homologous structure, um, cells are oriented to temporal frequency, not velocity. So it was really unexpected that finches would have um, a strong bias for velocity over independent orientations. And it's known that um, motion detecting neurons can have a difference or can have different tuning between their like kind of initial transient phase of the response and then the steady state phase. So um, using 2D Gaussians, we asked um, if the orientations change sort of be between these two, um, between velocity dependent and independent um, orientations when comparing the um, two phases of the response. Um, so this would be indicated by a shift in um, the velocity and independent correlations. And basically these shifts show that the zebra finches are initially oriented to temporal frequency. So having like a high R independent um, and then shift to uh, velocity orientation during the steady state response. Whereas hummingbirds um, kind of kept that same, the same relationship in both phases. So these results suggest an emerging diversity in an optic flow processing circuit considered to be um, highly conserved. Having kind of your sort of classic view, um, there's an, in, an initial open loop state where fast optic flow neurons will detect um, retinal slip or like um, the onset of self motion. Um, and then there's a stable closed loop state where um, the image is kept stable by the slow cells um, just maintaining. But in zebra finches, we show that most neurons prefer fast velocities. And then you have these temporal frequency oriented um, cells during the stimulus onset and velocity oriented during steady state. Um, so these cells could operate during both open and closed loop phases of the optic kinetic response as opposed to having like two classes, of, two types of neurons. Um, and then hummingbirds, you have, uh, they have a hyper hypertrophied LM and differences in their direction preference, and then they prefer high velocity motion, but are very narrowly tuned to low spatial frequencies. So these properties could facilitate maneuverability um, because of their lifestyle of, and frequent changes in direction and speed may mean frequently operating in this sort of open loop mode. So the kind of like next interesting question is how does behavioral state or a truly closed loop system affect these response properties? And the way, um, you know, there's a number of groups that are really trying to tackle this or have been for a while, but it's um, a lot of novel advances and miniaturizations of technology are sort of enabling researchers to close this loop um, more effectively or like on different scales, I guess. Um, to um, provide more realistic signals or perturbations during unrestrained behavior. So um, for instance, in this recent study, um, DeGroote and colleagues um, performed concurrent cellular resolution recordings from the cerebellum and cerebral cortex with a miniscope in unrestrained mice combined with optogenetic stimulation. And it allows for examination of circuit connectivity and multi-region circuit um, investigations during um, free ranging behavior. And then again, a number of groups are using external camera arrays and pose estimation algorithms and silicon probe implants to link large scale uh, neural activity to free ranging behavior. And in this example here, 
Um, these researchers also included or incorporated um, eye tracking and IMU data to get this kind of uh, dense array of recording data that's linked to behavioral state. And then finally, recently here in the UK, a group has used um, similar technology in sheep to study neurological diseases um, and acquire preclinical data. Um, so you can see that there's a number of ways in which um, systems neuroscience researchers can explore these sensory motor feedback loops um, and uh, motor related modulations of sensory physiology in increasingly intact preparations. Um, rather than strictly open loop conditions. And with that, I'll hand off to Brad. Thanks, I think you have a question in the chat. Oh, do cells necessarily have a, both a preferred direction and speed, or can some cells be direction specific and speed agnostic or vice versa? Um, yeah, they can be very broadly tuned. Like I've done, I think, in general, there will be some, there's some finite definition of what they can detect, but um, I've definitely seen very broadly tuned ones or ones that plateau. So I guess, I guess I'm up. So, uh, so from Dre's talking about using this, this, these kinds of um, control engineering topologies for thinking about experiments, I'm going to do a little bit of that, but also think about um, sort of the, as Noah was saying, thinking about feedback and feed forward control architectures and in the context of uh, fly flight. Um, and so the, the, the way I think about this is that um, these kinds of control architectures and especially what Noah mentioned about um, proportional integral, integral and derivative control controllers being really important for controlling behaviors where timing is really, really essential. Uh, and so we have a lot of examples in neurothology where timing is really important for controlling a lot of different complex behaviors, whether we're thinking about hunting in the case of barn owls or echolocating bats, or in the case of our weekly electric fish that Noah previously mentioned, in, in this case, um, detecting con specifics or, or the environment. In each of these animals, we've identified uh, sensory systems that can detect timing differences at the micro or nanosecond time scale. But that's at the level of the sensory system. And we're beginning to appreciate more and more the role of timing in the context of the motor system, whether it's human motor control, uh, songbird singing, or insect flight. And you now the my work focuses on sort of building a bridge between thinking about timing in the sensory and motor systems and using insect flight as my model. And, specific, and specifically, I focus on fly flight. And one of the reasons for that is that flies are extremely agile maneuver, maneuvers in the air. Uh, and they're beating their wings very, very fast. So they have to rapidly integrate um, sensory information and turn it into motor output um, on rapid time scales on the order of you know, five milliseconds um, if they're beating their wings about 200 times a second. Okay, so timing is really, really important in fly flight. And so the control architectures, we can, we can draw from um, control engineering to, to think about um, how, how this is all structured. But before we get to that, I, it's important that we sort of think about all the sort of constituents, the, the components of, of fly flight that are making this possible so that we can sort of ground our model in um, something, something real. Okay, so flying insects um, are unique compared to other flying animals in that all the power and control for flight is, resides in the thorax. There no, there's no musculature in the wings and Insect flight muscles are functionally distinct. This is true for all flying insects. We have muscles that are responsible for powering flight, which are called the power muscles. They make up the majority of the thorax and they are flapping the wings back and forth. And, um, and they're helping ge generate the initial lift to get off the ground. And then for, um, for maneuvers, they have a small set of steering muscles. And in the case of flies, they, um, they are, there are different flavors of these kinds of steering muscles. These are what are called um, indirect synchronous muscles, meaning that they are indirectly attached to the wing. They attach to elements of the thorax that are known as sclerites. All right. So this is just a, a high-speed video that's demonstrating a, a, a fruit fly during one of these maneuvers. And as I mentioned, the the steering muscles attached to elements of 
the um, of the thorax known as sclerites, which you can think of as being kind of tendon-like elements. <clears throat> and there are four relevant sclerites, and each sclerite has a set of muscles associated with it. So we have the basilar sclerite and its set of muscles, the first and third axillaries, and then the fourth axillary, which for historical reasons is known as the HG. So one thing I just wanna point out here is that there are not that many muscles, right? There are only about 12 muscles here and this fruit fly or any other fly that you see out in the world can generate a whole range of different kinds of aerial maneuvers. And so one way we think about this is that the motor system for steering is a sparse network. Now, something that makes this problem additionally challenging um, but also very interesting study is that each uh, steering muscle is innervated by a single motor neuron. So in contrast to um, the birds that Dre was talking about, which have you know, hundreds to thousands of motor neurons per muscle, in insect flight, the, the muscles that are controlling steering are each only have a single motor neuron, right? So, so how is it that you can get such a broad range of behavior from just a few muscles? Okay. Now we can further subdivide the muscles that control steering into two major groups. The first are muscles that are said to be tonically active. Now, these are muscles that fire every wing stroke at a precise time or phase in the stroke cycle. And fruit flies and you know, the hoverfly that I showed you at the beginning of this talk um, are being their wings in excess of 200 times a second. And so if you think about the motor neuron and muscle pair, that means that they're firing every five milliseconds and they're at the upper limits of what a, a neuron can do in terms of its performance. And so these muscles actually can't control, the motor neurons cannot control their spike rate while the animal's flying, but what they can do is control when in the stroke cycle they're active. And so by introducing say a phase delay where the muscle fires later in the stroke cycle or a phase advance, we know from biomechanical analyses that actually changes the the biomechanical properties of the muscle, effectively in, in some cases making it stiffer. And that can uh, lead to different changes in wing motion and aerodynamic forces. And these muscles tend to be involved in um, sort of slowly guided stabilization reflexes that I'll talk about um, a little bit later. Now, the other major flavor of steering muscles are muscles that are said to be physically active. And these are a little bit more intuitive where they're typically inactive, and then they come on in a short burst, but that burst is still locked to the stroke cycle, meaning that if you get five, um, five muscle action potentials, each one is firing at a, in a single wing stroke at precise time each stroke cycle. And these tend to be involved in, um, in more like active maneuvers. But in both cases, where we're talking about the tonically active muscles or the physically active muscles, um, timing is really, really important. And something else that I want, I want to point out, but I don't have the time to, to go into too much is that um, the muscles, so there are muscles associated with each sclerite and there's at least one tonically active muscle and at least one physically active muscle that is attached to each sclerite. But in any case, timing is really important. So how is um, the timing of when these muscles turn on determined? So to, to think about this, we should, sort of consider um, the evolutionary history of, of flies and flying insects more generally. Okay. So if we imagine um, a fly's four-winged ancestor, it's got four wings and the easiest thing you can imagine and, what, and, and um, an idea that Auk is gonna talk about and it was initially discovered in locusts, which are flying insects, is a central pattern generator that is controlling the output of both of these motor neurons or in this case, these, these, this pair of, of murmurs are controlling these muscles, right? And so certainly, like I said, locusts and grasshoppers and many, there are many large flying insects that are using a, a central pattern generator to control flight. Now, this actually kind of presents a problem because if we think about um, flying insects radiating and becoming a very successful group of organisms, what ended up happening is that they actually became smaller and smaller, right? And to accommodate um, their decreasing size, their wing beat frequency had to increase so that they could support their lift, right? Now, if we think about 
are low wing beat frequency, but rather large flying insects like a locust, right? We have it flapping its wings at a relatively low frequency. And if we think about um, our muscle, right? We can generate force during the downstroke. And remember that when the motor neuron um, excites the muscle, we get a, a large release of calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum, and that has to be recycled um, into back into sarcoplasmic reticulum. So that that takes time, that takes energy, but but our locust is flapping its wings slowly enough that that the muscle can recover each stroke cycle and generate enough force in the downstroke muscle to, to generate lift. Now for a small flying insect, like in this case, it's a, basically a mosquito. This is actually presents a bit of a problem because they're being their wings rather fast. And if the power muscles can generate enough force each wing stroke, well, basically they can't generate enough force each wing stroke. They can only generate enough force in this first wing stroke, but then it takes too much time to recycle that calcium so that when the muscle would be ready to fire again, it's actually in the wrong phase. And it's also, um, it's also a stroke late, right? And by contrast, if, this, if a muscle can generate enough, um, can generate force fast enough for how fast it's flapping its wing, it can't generate enough force to get off the ground. Right, so, so there's a problem with as flying insects radiated and game became smaller, you have this, this trade-off between the power that the muscle can generate and its temporal precision. But obviously small flying insects get off the ground just, just fine. And so a number of flying insects have evolved um, a really unique mechanism for, um, for, for flapping their wings where they decouple the neural input from the mechanics of flapping. So if we, if we take a look at like this Japanese beetle um, that are now out and about uh, where I am, if we were to just track wing motion, right? It's, it's flapping its wings rather normally. And if we were able to record from the muscles that are generating the flapping motion, what we'd see is, is something pretty surprising, which we have just one mo motion, muscle action potential for a number of contractions throughout flight. So we, we're decoupling um, neural input and mechanics. And, this, and so the, the power muscle of many flying insects like beetles, like flies, is what's said to be asynchronous, meaning that there is not a one-to-one -one correlation between um, motor spike and contraction, right? There, they, you get a number of contraction cycles um, for just one, one spike. And there's a whole literature on how this how this functions that, that we that I'm happy to talk to people about later, but we don't just don't have the time to get into. Um, and importantly, the so the the motor neurons that control the power muscles are operating at a, a using a low level central pattern generator. So if the wings are flapping at 200 hertz, this CPG for basically just providing enough calcium for the muscles to be active is operating at like five to 10 Hertz. But this doesn't mean that, um, just to, to sort of emphasize the point that Noah was making earlier about um, CPGs not being just purely feed forward, there is some evidence that, that flying insects that have uh, asynchronous flight muscle can use this muscle to help them steer. So just for, as an example, this is work from a few, about a decade ago, doing some calcium imaging of the power muscles while a fly is flying and just presenting different kinds of visual motion. And so they're just, um, can you see my pointer if I, if I move that? Okay, great. So they're just imaging from this region of the, um, of the thorax. And what you see is that if you just present a, a kind of visual motion stimulus where the world's just sort of moving back and forth in front of the animal, this is the stroke amplitude and so you, the fly, as you'd expect, is steering, right? Now, the muscles that are, that were, in this case, they're, they're recording from the muscles that are flapping the wings. And what you see is that you can actually modulate their power. So even though these muscles are on a, a low level CPG, and they're really just about power, you can still, um, mod, they can still modulate their output for steering, right? And so 
thinking about how activation phase is regulated for these, for our smaller flying insects, we're transitioning from basically a neural oscillator to more of a biomechanical oscillator. And the idea is that then you may have to rely on sort of sensory feedback that's arriving each wing stroke to control wing motion. And so there are a few examples that you can think of of animals that um, are flapping their wings about as fast as flying insects, or not flying insects, as flies, I should say, um, like bees and wasps, which have four wings and are being their wings like 200 times a second. Now flies, at least my thought is that flies take this one step further by, um, so one of the issues with having four wings is that in the case of, of bees and wasps or beetles, some beetles, um, your, your forewing and your hindwing are basically directly coupled. They're physically linked together. But in flies, you have this kind of separation of labor where you have a wing that, that generates aerodynamic forces and you have this unique structure that is basically a club that's beating back and forth and keeps time for um, the flight circuit. And this, the structure is called um, the halter. Now, how, how can we imagine the, that the fly is able to regulate activation phase if now we've gone from a neural oscillator to a biomechanical oscillator, and now we're relying on mechanosensory feedback, at least for, for controlling this sort of flight rhythm. Great. So if we imagine that we have a, if we're recording from a motor neuron, it's firing each wing stroke, so it's tonically active. The easiest thing you could imagine is that there's some command from the brain that's sent to this, to this muscle that controls both when it fires and the timing of its firing. And there's a lot of anatomical work demonstrating that there certainly are um, what are called descending interneurons that um, project to the flight control centers. But of the neurons that have been identified and recorded from so far, there's no evidence that they actually fire in this time-locked or phase-locked fashion. Instead, they provide what are called graded membrane potentials. So the idea is that, is that not only do flies rely, so well, the idea for a long time has been that flies rely on this what's called wing beat synchronous mechanosensory feedback to set the rhythm and then you're, you're mixing, um, you're combining this visual input with mechanosensory feedback to, to regulate timing, right? Okay. Now, this in principle works pretty well, but there's one hangup, which is that the wings are obvious sources of, of wing beat synchronous feedback because they're flapping each stroke cycle. And in addition, they have a set of mechanical sensors embedded within them that can report what the wing is doing each wing stroke. But if the fly attempts to turn, this is actually kind of problematic because the wings, the sensors embedded in the wings are just reporting the commands from the uh, wing steering muscle motor neurons, meaning that they can per give, give the fly uh, a sense of what is happening each wing stroke, but they cannot, um, you, you can't use the, this feedback to control the upcoming stroke, right? So if you want to turn in a few, in a few wing strokes, um, relying solely on the wings is problematic. And again, this is where the evolution of um, basically functional diptery or two, two wingedness in flies is very helpful because where they have, they both have these aerodynamically functional forewings and they have this structure that's evolved from the hind wing that looks like a sort of club on a stick, which is called the halter. And the halter is an essential uh, can sensory structure for flies. If you cut off a fly, cannot fly. And um, it has embedded within it hundreds of mechanic sensors that are known as companiform scintilla, which basically act as strain sensors. And you can find these on, on many insects anywhere you get bending and twisting. So places like the legs, um, the wings, in some cases, the antennae. And in the case of flies, true flies, we'll also find them on uh, the halt tiers. Okay, so we can, so flies rely on mechanosensory feedback to control uh, flight, but can we be a little bit more specific about that? All right, so this muscle here, this 
is called B1, the first basilar muscle. And it's a really unique muscle because it is basically the only muscle, if you record of the muscles that you can record from in flies, um, is the only muscle that fires each wing stroke once per stroke cycle. So it's tonically active and it fires precise time each stroke cycle. And so if you do this, so, so what you find is you get um, up top is the, the um, muscle action potentials from the B1 muscle and below is the wing stroke. And this is just a zoom in of a few wing strokes. And you can see that this muscle is firing um, a preferred activation phase. And what we know from some work um, back in the eighties is that if you have an intact fly, you can record from this muscle and it's firing each wing stroke at a precise time. You can actually remove both of the wings and one halt here and still uh, maintain this, this phase preference. But if you remove both the wings and both halt tiers, then even if you can get the fly to sort of do something that, that approximates flying with um, its power muscles, this muscle does not fire a preferred phase. And so the idea here is that it's <coughs> for this muscle to have its preferred phase, it relies on mechanosensory feedback, right? So we're seeing already that in flies where you, you, have a, you have a CPG and you have uh, sort of reflex loops that are controlling um, different aspects of flight control. All right. so, one, so one important role for the halt here is basically to help set the flight rhythm. Another um, kind of famous role for the halt here is that it acts as a bio, it's nature's only biological gyroscope. So what do I mean by that? So if we have a fly that's flapping its, its wing and halt here, um, and this dotted line basically just represents the arc that the halt here is going through. So it's basically just going in a straight line while the halt here is beating. And you imagine that there's some sort of instability, in this case, a pitch, whether due to wing damage or a gust of wind. The halt here has a, because it's moving and it has mass, has a tendency to continue oscillating its original plane of motion. So as the fly gets rotated, what ends up happening is that the tip path trajectory of the halt here changes, in this case, into more of an oval shape. <coughs> And um, this is actually due to something called the Coriolis force. And the Coriolis force is proportional to the cross product of the fly's angular velocity. So the angular velocity of its body and the tip path velocity of the halt here. And so what this allows the fly to do is, is get an estimate of both how fast it's rotating and um, the direction it's rotating. And the halt here um, has, helps trigger some reflexes in the head and wings to help the fly right itself. And so for a long time, the way we think about halt here function is that it's basically a fly's sort of cruise control. So if you think about cruise control from the perspective of like a car, where we have some, some desired velocity, we have some measured velocity, there's a sensor in your car, and then the, that sensor is comparing the desired velocity with the actual velocity, and then using the controller and actuators helping regulate that that velocity um, while you're while you're on the road. And in a fly's case, the way we think about this is that the fly has a desired angular velocity and a measured angular velocity, and the halt here is measuring that <coughs> and then sending that error signal. Um, in this case, in the in the form of um, a timing signal to the wing steering muscles. Okay. Now this is just sort of, this is a very kind of loose way of thinking about this kind of control architecture. So can we be a little bit more formal? So there are a few ways that people have been, have tr attempted studying um, the halt here and its role in flight control, especially with respect to behavior. So one of these ways is by doing these, these kind of virtual perturbations where this is, um, something that was developed called the Moroccan roll arena, where you have a fly tethered to a pin placed in a visual arena that is actually a, um, controlled by a set of motors. And then you can actually rotate the fly about any arbitrary axis. So in this case, yaw, and then um, in this case, pitch, and then finally roll. And so because of this, you can now tightly control <coughs> the kind of mechanical sensory feedback the fly is experiencing. Right, and so as we increase the angular velocity, we'll increase the, the Coriolis force experienced by, um, by the fly. And when you do that, what you find is that as you increase angular velocity, you get an increasing response from the fly in terms of its 
um, wing steering correction, correctional maneuvers. And so the idea, and because it's basically directly proportional to the perturbation, the idea from these experiments is that the halt here is um, basically a purely a proportional controller. Okay. Now, more recently, there have been some experiments. Um, this is work by Itai Cohen's group, where you have a freely flying fly and you, you tether to it, you glue it to a small ferromagnetic pin and it's freely flying. And now you present different kinds of um, perturbations using a magnetic field and look at how the fly is able to recover with just a small perturbation. And so doing this, so here's a <laughs> photo montage of, of a perturbation in the fly recovering. When they do this, so these orange dots are the data. They can actually fit a proportional integral controller um, to, to these data. So the, and so we have this kind of this discrepancy where based on one style of experiments, you'd expect the halt here is merely proportional controller and using a different style of experiments, you get a PI controller, which we would expect to be more robust. Now, how can we kind of reconcile this? And is there anything from other kinds of experiments that we can use at a, from, as a hint for what may be going on? So um, using, so people have been thinking about doing similar work in the visual system and doing electrophysiology on <coughs> Um, some neurons that are kind of similar to what Dre talked about. Um, and in this case, what we know from the behavior is that if you present a, a, an open loop visual stimulus where the fly cannot control its sensory experience, that behavior, behavior, the behavior sort of exhibits characteristics consistent with a proportional integral controller where you have this kind of waterfall effect of after the stimulus goes off, the, the fly isn't just reset to its original baseline value, right? There's kind of a tail. Now, if you record from these, these inner neurons electrophysiologically, what you find is that actually they seem to behave, the electrophysiology suggests they behave more like a derivative control. They, can, they care about the velocity of the stimulus. But if you do calcium imaging and look at the calcium dynamics of, of these neurons, then what you see is that you can actually see that there's kind of an integral controller in the calcium dynamics of these neurons. Right, so there's potential for PI control in the visual system. And um, we also see that if we can record from, we also know that from recording from the, uh, the wing steering muscles using calcium imaging, that we actually get, not only do we have these muscles that are tonically and phasically active, but muscles that seem to be phasically active. So again, those muscles that fire in so sort of short bursts that are still time locked to, um, to the fit to the, the stroke cycle, they seem to display characteristics that are more consistent with proportional, a proportional controller where they just come on, then they come off after the stimulus goes off. And then your, your tonically active muscles <coughs> seem to exhibit characteristics that are consistent with a, an integral controller. All right. Now, going back to the halt here, we know that it provides input to a a single motor neuron, this muscle I, I mentioned already, B1. And what we find is that for both the wing and halt here, which are providing this, this muscle with feedback, is that there's both, there's a mixed electro, <coughs> electrical and chemical synapse where there's a very fast electrical component. And then in both cases, there's a chemical component to, to this um, postsynaptic potential. And you can see that this chemical component has a, a really long tail, which, which may be sort of an integral, right? Okay. So, um, so the halt here not only has these mechanical sensors embedded within it, but because it is evolved from the hind wing, it also has a set of uh, muscles that receive visual input. And um, we don't need to worry about the names, but they're, they're just called the basilars and axillaries. And something I showed um, was that flies can actually control the halt here and the mechanical sensory feedback it provides to control the wing steering system um, through something called the control loop where, if, where <clears throat> you can imagine a situation where a fly is flying, it's receiving visual input, that information is sent to the halt here muscles that actually change the motion of the halt here and 
the, the level of mechanical sensory feedback that arrives to each wing stroke, which can change the timing or the activation of these different wing steering muscles and change aerodynamic forces and how the fly flies. Okay, so we have this sort of sense of how the information is flowing, but now given that we have this, these ideas for this kind of expectation for what's happening um, in terms of kind of architecture for control, both at the level of the visual system and we have these, these competing hypotheses for the hall tier system, can we sort of explore this um, a little bit more in depth? So again, we have these two kind of competing hypotheses of if the hall tier is a PI or, or a P controller. And so something that, that my lab is working on, but that um, I just wanna show you like a, an, an idea from, from this is that what we can do is record the um, calcium activity from the hall tier nerve while the fly is flying using, a, using two photon microscopy. So what's, so this is a, a video of, this is the right halt here outlined in red, and this is gonna be the calcium signal, and I'm gonna plot the right wing beat amplitude and the change in fluorescence in the halt here nerve when the world appears to rotate to the fly's left. And so the fly is gonna try and minimize retinal slip. And so the right wing beat amplitude is going to increase. And so let's see what happens. And so just, and well, just something I should point out is that this is, the fly's ventral nerve cord. So this is the haltier nerve um, of here. And <laughs> these are the axon terminals from which I'm recording in the brain in a region called the subesophageal zone. Okay, so there are two things I wanna point out. First is that before the stimulus comes on, the stimulus is this gray box, there's a baseline level of activity in the haltier nerve, which is consistent with the idea of haltier's beating and providing rhythmic feedback to the wing steering system. Now, if the halt here were merely um, just a, a kind of <coughs> um, both a proportional controller, but, but merely a gyroscope that, that depend on body rotation, then you shouldn't see any change in the halt here calcium activity, right? But instead we see, we see that there is an increase in calcium activity when the stimulus comes on. Now, and again, if the halt here was merely a proportional controller, then when the stimulus goes off, then we should see basically a drop pretty soon after the stimulus comes off. But we see this lingering effect, which is kind of consistent with both the, some, a little bit of what we know about the physiology of the halt here, but also the idea that the halt here may be a proportional integral controller. So um, yeah. So yeah, my lab is starting to look at this a little bit more and more using um, some of the other tools that we have available. Um, both like two photon microscopy and also thinking about proportional integral control in the in the, the halt here steering system. So looking at those different muscles to look for any evidence of of, <coughs> um, of proportional integral control there, and and then thinking about ultimately can we sort of take advantage of this control loop to look at can we recapitulate the PI nature of of wing steering just using the haltier system. All right, so with that, I can now hand it off to, um, to Aka. Uh, Brad, I have one question. Um, yeah. for, thank you for a great talk, by the way. Uh, so you. what happens behaviorally if you, if you remove only one altier? Um, you said, yeah, you still, you still have phase locking, but uh, how, how is this the flying behavior? Oh yeah, so... Um, so actually, Jessica Fox, who I think is is here, um, or she was here. She she had a student who. So what they were able to do was glue a little um, iron filing to to a single halt here, and then using um, <coughs> using electromagnet like control a single halt here. And so you can. My recollection is, and and uh, my recollection is that you you basically disrupt flapping that way. Um, at least on one on one side. I don't think it's, I don't think it disrupts um, both sides. And Jess, if she's here, can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, now, the thing that makes that kind of tricky is that is that there's a lot of crosstalk uh, from the ipsilateral and contralateral sides to the halt from the halt here to mm -hmm. the wing. Yeah, super. Yeah, thanks. I guess in interest of time, I should I should probably start. So thanks again, Brad and. Uh... Let me share screen here. You should see yourself, and now you should see my slides. I hope is that okay? Yeah, 
everyone? Yeah, super. So, so I still hope you have a bit of energy left in, in the next 20 minutes, 25 minutes. I want to go briefly uh, show some work we do indeed in um, studying this very interesting interaction between CPGs and um, reflexes, more into terrestrial and, and swimming behavior. So, so uh, I'm fascinated by animals, uh, mammals like here doing steady state locomotion, the nervous system solving a very com complex pro control problem. And, but what's, what's important for me is that animals are rarely in steady state. So animals tend to, to do more uh, like modulation of locomotion all the time. And here I'm always fascinated by these agility competitions where, where you see all the beauty of, of what the animals have to do, maybe not in their daily life, but a bit representative of, of uh, having to modulate all the time, the heading, the speed of locomotion, the posture overall. And it's really amazing for me how, how, how the nervous system can do this so, so beautifully. And I think robotics can help to understand a bit the components and model them with some first order or second order approximation and see how this all interacts. So as you all agree, I think the key components, first of all, the, the musculoskeletal system, which is very important. And then for, for vertebrate animals, you have the spinal cord uh, and the series of reflexes and central pattern generators, which are uh, very similar to those found in insects as well. So the fact that you have uh, intrinsic systems that can by themselves generate rhythms, I would call them feed forward controllers, the, the CPG controllers, but I'll come back to that later. I, I find it beautiful how they are nicely implemented to allow more or less the right patterns and how then sensory feedback plays a big role to modulate them and adapt to, to different conditions. And, and this interplay between sensory feedback loops and CPGs is, I think, uh, a very fascinating problem. Then, of course, we should never underestimate high parts of the brain that modulates this. And, and what's interesting, I think, in the first video that I showed where there was a steady state locomotion, my prediction would be that the, the dimensionality of the drive signal is very low. It's mainly a global drive that set the frequency. The more you drive, the higher the drive, the faster the locomotion. But otherwise, it's really the spinal cord circuits that are mainly charged for, for steady state. And obviously, for the, the more complex, sorry, the more complex modulation of the second video, there you have much more descending modulation all the time to place your feet in the right place to reorient all the time. So I'm, I'm fascinated by that. And, and from a robotics point of view, I think nature has really done a beautiful way of having this multi-layered control and giving this big responsibility to the spinal cord circuits. Because as you know, neurons are super slow uh, compared to electrical circuits. So it makes sense to give as much as responsibility as possible to the spinal cord. So that high part of the brain uh, doesn't need to worry about those, all the muscle fibers. A high part of the brain should only worry about high level modulation signals. And then it's really the job of the, the spinal cord to, to modulate all this activity. And that's why I, I like this uh, image of Jerry Lubb of seeing the, the spinal cord and the musculoskeletal system as a puppet on string where playing with a finite set of descending drive modulating mainly the CPGs, but also modulating reflexes, you can generate a whole whole series of movements and, and the spinal cord are, are basically building blocks for, for, for movement. And by, by the way, my talk will be a bit high level. I will have a bit like take home messages uh, in, in red boxes to, to wake you up. And, and, and uh, these are a bit the high level messages that I, I like to communicate. But uh, First of all, at this level here, I want to say the beauty of the spinal cord, the, the fact that it can produce this low bandwidth communication between the higher centers and, and the spinal cord, that it can implement fast feedback loops locally, and, and it provides kind of motor primitives for large range of movements to higher part of the brain. Now, I have this hypothesis a bit that the respective role of CPGs versus sensory feedback versus descending modulation has potentially changed with during evolution, with lower vertebrates being more driven by CPGs um, and higher vertebrates being more driven by sensory feedback loops and by descending modulation. And this is just a, a kind of vague hypothesis, but I think models can try to, to support this and, and, and explore a bit the space of combination of CPGs and, and reflexes. So that's exactly what we do in the lab. We, we make models of the spinal cord circuits, both the CPGs and the feedback loops. 
and we couple them. We, we love robots in the lab, so we, we couple them with real robots if we can uh, to have real physics, like for swimming, for instance, good to have real physics. And we often close the loop also with neuromechanical simulations because that's, that's simpler, to be honest. So let me show first what we did uh, quite some time ago on the salamander, but that, that is a good starting point, I think, for the discussion I'd like to have later. So quite some time ago, uh, we wanted to model this beautiful switch of locomotion in salamanders between the anguliform swimming that you see on, on the left to the, the walking trot that you see on the right. And, and what's kind of beautiful here is that this transition can be obtained in a decerbated animal. So if you unlikely stimulate the descending pathways, at low level of stimulation, you have the walking gait. If you increase a bit the stimulation, the speed will increase. And at some point there's a threshold and it will bifurcate and switch to, to swimming. So just changing the global drive applied to the descending pathways can completely switch between these motor behaviors. So we were fascinated by that. So we, we wanted to see what could be the underlying CPG circuit producing this. So we, we started by a CPG circuit very similar to the one found in the lamprey for swimming, and then added oscillators on top of it to explore this transition from swimming to walking. Uh, I don't have time to go in details, but basically in this type of models, these are super abstract models, like uh, representing whole population of uh, neurons that oscillate by a single oscillator and then having uh, multiple oscillators representing the distributed CPG in, in, in the spinal cord. Plus some additional tricks with saturation of, of if you drive the oscillators too much. So this is all the works. I don't want to spend too much time on that, but what I think was the, the main message here is, is showing the beauty of CPGs. In fact, the fact that by just two descending drives, the, the arrows that you see on the right, we could, with a, these are done by remote control, we could completely modulate the speed, the heading, and the type of gate, just in open loop by the CPG, the, the distributed oscillators that we modeled on, on the robot. But I think that's important because that, that going back to this idea of modulation of speed and, and heading, that's that's what CPGs are for, I think. They are really beautiful building blocks for modulating locomotion extensively and to do it in a low dimensional way with just two, two strings to the puppet in this case. Okay, so I think that's important because sometimes people see CPGs as producing just one pattern, but no, uh, CPGs can really produce a very rich set of patterns with just a few inputs. I think that, that's the beauty of, of CPGs. Now, Interestingly, I started my career as a CPG person and seeing sensory feedback as a nice addition, <laughs> but now I'm switching a bit hat. I see sensory feedback as also being super important. And, and the, the two are so beautifully coupled that you should never have one without the other. That's why, like Noah perfectly said at the beginning, uh, CPGs being alone is a very pathological case. They're always in close loop with sensory feedback. And, and uh, as you know, it has always been a big debate, in fact, in neuroscience. How, should we see locomotion as more uh, sensory driven, like a chain of reflexes, as Sherrington had proposed? Or should we see locomotion more as uh, neural oscillator driven, like half central driven, like Graham Brown? And, and of course, the answer is both. I think both are, are, are correct and, and they are very tightly integrated. And here, the two diagrams I show at the top are, are this beautiful paper, is this beautiful paper by Art Kuo, which very systematically explores how, in principle, you can generate rhythms in a pendulum driven by muscles. And I think he beautifully shows that you could do more or less exactly the limit cycle on one extreme by being purely sensory driven. On the other extreme, you can be purely sensory driven. But combining both is the more optimal way of doing it to be resistant to, to perturbations, both internal and external. I'll come back to briefly to later on, but uh, conceptually he was already nicely exploring this, this notion of uh, CPG driven versus sensory driven. And interestingly, I think it's related to seeing more motion as being in control of the peripheral nervous system or the central nervous system or Loose, in loosely term, being more feedback driven or more feed forward driven. Even if I agree with Noah that CPG should not just be, say, just is not purely feed forward, but it's, it's, it has a feed forward flavor. Uh, 
um, obviously to it. And, and just to to document that a bit more, I think most people in, in the CPG community would say that CPGs are a bit feed forward controllers. Why? Because of this fictive locomotion experiment where, where you indeed completely isolate the neural oscillators, you apply them a drive electrically or pharmacologically, and, and you see that you have nice patterns emerging, rhythmic, that are coordinated, and that, for instance, in the lamprey, correspond very well to what you expect during closed loop swimming. So it, it, I would call it like a, what, what, um, yeah, basically a feed forward controller or implicit inverse model where you, you apply the input a speed signal, the higher the signal, the higher the desired speed, and you get the rhythmic pattern to produce that. So that's why I, I would say it's, it's a kind of, it has a really feed forward uh, flavor. And for me, the key thing is really initiating and modulating speed and, and, and heading, uh, so modulating locomotion. Uh, I think that's a key role of CPGs. Another role is to simplify indeed the communication between high part of the brain and low part of the brain. And also not only that, but to transform uh, tonic signals like a speed, just a constant signal into a rhythmic signal, which is a complex transformation. And finally, CPGs help to handle noise and also to inhibit reflexes at key moments during locomotion. I think it's, it's, it's the, the kind of four important roles of CPGs. Now, one thing that Noah a bit alluded to is an alternative view is, is to see a CPG as a state estimator. That's in fact a very interesting point of view that had in, indeed been proposed, uh, at least one, one of the big proposals of that was Art Kuo in this 2002 paper. And I, I think it's a very interesting idea. I think the, the idea is that you, it could be that the neural oscillator is there as, as to predict a bit what the limb is doing as an internal model with which you can then compare the actual sensory information. So it's more like a yeah, state estimator and a filter for processing sensory information rather than a direct generator of commands. And uh, what's very interesting in the paper of Art is that he can show that uh, when you combine it with a feedback controller, uh, with the right tuning of both, you can be optimal in terms of robust against noise, internal and external. And you get the fictive locomotion made for free. If you remove sensory feedback, it becomes indeed a, a feed forward uh, oscillatory system. So I think this is interesting. Um, to be honest, I think one part that Arco is a bit missing is this importance of modulation of speed. I think I, I still believe uh, CPGs are, have a very important role of generator and, and for changing speed and going fast or slow and modulating. So I think everything that's in here relates very well if I could just go back to the last two points of important roles, handling sensory noise and inhibiting reflexes. But I think art misses a bit the, the modulation aspect and uh, the reducing of dimensionality aspect. So art is a good friend. I, I think he would agree with me that that's maybe one component he, he hasn't addressed so much. And finally, I think very important, uh, Noah also mentioned that we should always see CPGs as distributed systems. It's both a challenge, but an opportunity um, uh, to, to, to the fact that it's distributed is in fact uh, an opportunity because you can, it, it can mean that sensory feedback can have a very interesting role within the oscillation, for instance, to adjust phase relationships. And it also allows descending modulation to play with the intrinsic frequencies of the few oscillators and completely change the phase relationship. So uh, always remember that CPGs being distributed is very good for rich motor skills. A few descending sets can completely then modulate the locomotion. Okay, so, so now in the discussion of closing the loop, uh, of course we have to take into account the biomechanics and, um, and here I think robotics and, and biomechanics can help to, to show, first of all, that in principle, you don't need the control to do locomotion. So that's an extreme case. Uh, there, there's no debate anymore if it's feed forward feedback. This is purely mechanical uh, with a passive walker going down the ramp. Or with these beautiful examples of Jim Liao of this trout swimming in a, a vortices, a, a Carmen Street of vortices, 
and, and showing that the dead trout can swim. So uh, this is purely viscalistic properties benefiting from the interaction with the environment. So I think these are two extreme cases to show that the missing part is the body and almost doing a readout of the body could in principle be sufficient to, to do locomotion. And here I, I wanted to briefly show some recent work we did on purely swimming, like eel-like or lamprey-like swimming. Because here, uh, for instance, eel is super impressive in the sense that if you make a transaction of the spinal cord of an eel in one or two places, it can still swim in an almost identical way to the intact system. So completely cutting the coupling between oscillators in one or two places, below the lesions you still see oscillations and they still keep synchronized in a perfect way almost with the upper part of the body. So that, that clearly shows that somehow the, the loss coupling is compensated by sensory feedback signal to keep the synchronization. Otherwise they will drift and, and you will not stay synchronized. So uh, that's why these days, as mentioned, we, we look a lot on sensory feedback in, 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 the, in, in the lab to see how sensory feedback plays this nice role of comp uh, complementing CPGs. So the first obvious role of, of, central uh, of sensory feedback is to handle perturbation. So um, here it's very easy to show that if on the left you are open loop, you cannot handle per external perturbation from the environment like a speed barrier. And if you close the loop with distributed stretch sensors, you have a local stiffening, stiffening mechanism that allow you to, to, to cross the speed barrier. So that I would say is the first role you expect from sensory feedback is help handle external perturbations. But nowadays, what we're finding out is that sensory feedback can do much more than that. It can really help synchronize or even generate rhythms. And here I, I wanted to show this work of Robin uh, Sandjakal and colleagues from the lab, where using again, super simple models, uh, we wanted to see how we could get a, a, a CPG model made of a chain of coupled oscillators. So it's a phase oscillator model. So we have a local oscillator with a local intrinsic frequency, the omega term. We have a coupling between the oscillators, that's the second term, that that's like a, provides a phase relationship. And we have the local feedback, in this case from an external uh, receptor measuring the force on the skin, left and right. And we wanted to see using this very simple model and also simulated muscle models, how different components would be able to generate swimming. So for that, we also build a robot with these uh, four sensors and driven by these simulated muscle models. And uh, what you see are on the left and right are these, these plates. These are, are have four cells behind and they measure the local interaction forces. And, and we take the difference between left and right. And what's important is the, the feedback is only local. So the, it's only a local projection to the local oscillator. Now, having the robot and the, the controller, we could systematically explore different possible combinations between uh, the oscillators and the feedback loops. With on one extreme on the left is the, what we call the central, uh, the CPG controller, which is purely open loop. It has a couple oscillators and it's, I would say, purely feed forward. Now in the middle are interesting combinations where we can have the local feedback and in one case, remove the coupling. That's called the decoupled case, like an extreme example of the eel experiment. On the third column is the oscillator free case where we kill the local oscillators. We set omega to zero. So there's no intrinsic rhythm generation anymore. And on the right is the combined controller, so where everything fits together. And what we could show basically is, is how everything works and especially this beautiful role of the sensory feedback. So we could show that uh, if we remove coupling and we include feedback, we can have beautiful behaviors as I would like to show just now. So maybe look first on the video on the left where um, we, we have no sensory feedback, no coupling. There's no way that the system on the left can swim. Uh, it, has, it has no synchronization mechanism. Now, if you look on the video on the right, there we still don't have couplings, but we add sensory feedback. 
And thanks to the sensory feedback, we have a beautiful synchronization phenomena that, that appears. And you, you, after a little transient, you will converge nicely to a traveling wave mode. So that, that, that's a beautiful emergent property of the biomechanics and the sensory feedback, with sensory feedback playing a role in synchronizing the decoupled oscillators. So, and, and here the embodiment is key. It's really the, the physical properties and the body asymmetries in that, and the feedback that lead to forward locomotion. And this also works on the, on the real robot. As, as it takes a bit of time to, to, the transient mode is a bit long, but once you, after a short transient um, or a relatively long transient, you get into the steady state and you have beautiful swimming. So to be honest, we were a bit surprised to have so good swimming. We were, not, we were kind of expecting some synchronization, but not as beautiful as, as it is. Uh, I'll just skip this slide because I'm a bit behind schedule. Now, final message of the paper was to see how is this system robust if you start lesioning the system, if you kill some sensors or if you can kill some couplings. And, and so what we could do is take each type of controller and systematically apply perturbations to it. And for instance, if we take the CPG controller and we start removing coupling, and if there's no feedback, you very rapidly get distorted and, and you lose swimming speeds. So, so that's, that's really bad. And uh, the same thing, sorry, I go a bit fast, but if you remove the sensory signals in the purely decoupled case, so if you remove the, the signals coming from the sensors, here again, you become very fragile against muted sensors. But if you put everything together, if you have the combined system, which has both the, the oscillators, the coupling and the sensors, there you become surprisingly robust. So uh, you really can cut the system in many ways and it's only at extreme uh, levels of disruptions that you start having the swimming that being disrupted. So there's a beautiful redundancy and robustness by having these two systems together. Okay, so, so the whole system is much more robust against perturbations. And that's basically a take home message of that paper is that there's a beautiful redundancy between central and peripheral mechanism and, and uh, the two together are much more robust against lesion than any of these mechanisms alone. So um, don't underestimate CPGs, they are very powerful, but don't underestimate sensory feedback as well because it, it's kind of redundant to what the CPG does. And for sure it can uh, handle perturbation, but even better, it can synchronize oscillators, generate rhythms. And, and therefore I think we should really see locomotion as a self-organized process. And the more I'm working on CPGs, the more I think that the coupling should be fairly weak. We should never coupling a couple oscillates too much. I think in animals, the coupling is not, are not so strong. And the sensory feedback is a, plays a big role in sensory synchronization. Okay, so um, I, I think I should maybe finish here because uh, the time is up. I, I had a whole, a whole part of the talk on human locomotion. Uh, I, I, in one, in 10 seconds, the summary of human locomotion is human locomotion needs to be much more sensory driven and you could, in principle, you don't need oscillators, but by adding oscillators, you become much better at speed control. And, and we have a, a whole paper that studied that, but I, 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 I'm much too late. So I, I skipped that the whole thing, but the, the whole idea of the, the, the modeling we did on human locomotion is Starting from a sensory driven system, by adding just oscillates to the hip, we can be very good at speed locomotion, uh, speed control, something that would be very hard to do in a purely sensory driven signal. And interestingly, I, I saw Monica joining. Um, this erratically cor also correlates with what she proposed in, in, in the fact that we find out the best place to where to add the input of a CPG on human locomotion is at the more proximal joints, the more like the hips while the most distal joints can be more sensory driven. So internally, there could be a gradient of being more CPG driven by the proximal joints and more sensory driven by the distal uh, joints. Okay, I, I'll, I'll skip here. Uh, I think I, you got all the messages. Also, I want to go back to this evolution question later in modeling to, to show maybe this uh, relative role changing. I think that's uh, maybe also an important message. And I think that's it. I'd like to thank the people who are involved in this and also you for listening. And I hope you still have a bit of energy left until now.
and now we can have a short discussion. There will be a second workshop where we go over this in detail. So um, this was the first, the goal was first to show some ideas here and in the second workshop, we can go deeper into this. Great, so let's see if there are some questions. I, um, I see some questions in the chat. Um, so let's let's start. Um, okay, that, that was by Eugene. Um, so the question is, I'm curious if you have thought on evolutionary advantages of CPG system, that CPG system provide animal locomotion that cause them to evolve in addition to reflex systems. Are there any good papers that investigate this? So the, the question is, uh, what are the benefits of CPGs? And here I would say the benefits for me are really modulation, initiation, modulation of speed. That's where the you have the best input to the spinal cord to modulate locomotion. And the second aspect is the one brought forward by Art Kuo, is this kind of um, state estimation and handling sensory noise. If you lose sensors or if they're noisy, uh, you cannot be purely sensory driven. Having a CPG component makes you much more robust. So I would say to answer that to a question, CPGs are good for modulation and robustness. Okay, I suggest maybe if there are questions for, for everyone, we can take a few more minutes. I, I don't know, um, uh, Monica and, and Brooke, what you, what you think. I, I don't know if you're strict in timing uh, or if we have a bit of, of more time. I'm happy to stay a bit longer if people want. And I don't know, Brad, Andrea, Noah, if you have time. If you're uh, willing to stay, you can stay a little longer and answer questions, sure. Super, so let, let's see, um, anyone? <laughs> I, uh, I answered a question in the Q&A. I'll just maybe expand a little bit on the question that was asked, which was a good one is like, you know, um, and many people could even criticize a lot of the work that I've done in my lab as being these very simple transfer function models of behavior and controllers. And why do we use that instead of state space approaches? And I would say, you know, really it's been a matter of um, um, experimental and computational convenience. And I have no, uh, you know, we, I prefer from an experimental point of view, at least as a starting point, to look at input output models of the dynamics for a number of reasons. One is to start with a state space model, sort of presumes that we even know the dimension of that state space, much less, uh, you know, what it's what the what the appropriate representation is. For people that are familiar with state space models, you'll know that state space models are, you know, only the same up to a change in coordinates. And also state space uh, descriptions have trouble dealing with nasty things like delays, which are infinite dimensional in state space. Um, and then you end up with gross things like uh, delay differential equations. But in transfer function speak, um, you simply can uh, represent that as a, as a very simple transfer function. It's deceptively simple, actually, a very simple transfer function. And so if you're working in a regime where the behavior is near an equilibrium, and, um, then it can be an appropriate starting point to think about input output models. But if you're interested in your know, nonlinear behaviors that get you far away from an equilibrium, then it's really essential to think uh, in in other terms, either nonlinear input output representations, which are, are are not standard in the field. There's different approaches like, you know, Wiener kernels and so forth, but uh, um, or to use sort of nonlinear parametric um, uh, gray box models, for example, that are nonlinear um, in order to kind of expand your view, view from, you know, away from uh, the linear dynamics. I'll say one last thing, which is that we study a lot of nonlinear phenomena. And one of the ways we do that is by examining ways in which the linear approximations fail. And so the linear approximations are extremely easy to manage in terms of how you fit them to data and so forth. And if you can expose ways in which simple things like superposition and scaling fail, that reveals interesting insights into the underlying nonlinear dynamics. But you're afforded the convenience of using linear tools to identify those nonlinears, which then, which then require further analysis, but it's a convenient starting point. And uh, Dre, you've got a question in the q and I think. Yeah, I'll just read it. Okay, so um, seems like the tuning of the optic flow neurons for several stimulus properties was intermediate for the finch relative to the pigeon and hummingbird. Is there some kind of scaling that might arise as a result of the size of the animal based on the data from other species where LM neurons have been recorded? Um, I, I mean, I, 
Uh, I suspect that it's it has more to do with, I'll make sure I understand the question. Um, okay. Um, uh, I don't know if anybody has looked at like si size of animal, it's related to LM function, um, but I suspect it's just, it's more related to behavioral um, mode, behavioral needs. Um, I mean, people have studied the LM or like the homologous structure in like a lot of animals, like wallabies, turtles, frogs, like, and in general, the way that those days, I mean, these are like studies from like the 80s, 90s, um, the way that people analyze those data, at least at that time, it was mostly just looking at, um, not just, but mostly looking at direction, um, sort of velocity tuning and um, not like getting very granular with the um, analyses. And it, and they, at least direction wise, very similar. I can't recall off the top of my head how different velocity is. Um, so, the you know my thinking would be that it's has to do with the uh like the fact that hummingbirds hover and that there are other like sort of their behavioral demands um or demands of the be, due to the um environment that require them to be able to like dart around and so forth and they have to process that visual information very quickly um to so as not to collide with things um yeah think. Great. In, in fact, I forgot that I have a meeting now. So I, sh I should probably leave quite soon. Uh, somebody's waiting in my Zoom room. Um, so it, uh, it's great, was great for, for everyone to, to talk. Uh, by the way, Monica, thanks again for the invitation. And I don't know what you think, all of you, but for me, it was very stimulating. We had quite some sessions to prepare, and these were really fun. So uh, we should definitely go uh, back to all these questions when we have the second workshop, because I found it super stimulating. So I was super happy to be here today. Thank you so much. And sorry, I wasn't able to join for the whole time. Uh, it was a little chaotic in my house this morning. So with the kids getting ready for camp and things. but. Um, I will catch up on the parts that I missed, and I, I thank you so much for your efforts making such a nice session. It's really great. Super. Yeah. Thank you guys for organizing this, Monica. The deadline was incredibly valuable in getting us to actually get this across the finish line. <laughs> <laughs> Looking forward to the, the next session. It's really been a stimulating set of um, meetings yeah. up to this. Thanks so much. Great. Yeah. So bye-bye, everyone. I have to drop out. Bye-bye.